Hey everybody, my name is Adam Paul Susnick. I am the founder of Segregation by Design. It's a project that uses historic photography to document the destruction of communities of color in American cities due to redlining, urban renewal, and highway construction. So I recently had the opportunity to write an article for the New York Times. You might have seen it, and a lot of a lot of what I'm going to be discussing today was in that article. The intent of this project is to go city by city, showing how federal government and federal funding for highway construction and urban renewal had a devastating impact on basically each and every American city at the particular expense of communities of color. So these are some of the cities that I have covered so far, and most of the examples from today will be from these cities. This is the complete list of cities that I intend to cover. These are cities that received federal funding for highway construction and urban renewal through two bills in particular, the 1949 Federal Housing Act and the 1956 Federal Highway Act. And again, in the following images, nearly all the projects are funded by those two bills in particular, the 49 Housing Act and the 56 Highway Act. What I'm gonna do today is present the problems posed by freeways, I'll explain this image in a second, present the problems posed by freeways and urban, urban renewal projects, the history of how we got here and what we can do about it. So this is Tampa, Florida. Tampa is divided by interstates, which divide the city pretty cleanly along racial lines. Rather than pursuing ways to lessen this divide, in the last decade, FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, has actually just placed an additional 750 families, roughly 2,250 individuals, with freeway endings in Tampa alone. The I-4, pro the I-4 connector project here cost $500 million, so that's, that's where they're spending their money rather than trying to solve this divide. And the connector divides the historic neighborhood of Ybor City in half, separating the working class, mostly Caribbean American, East Ybor, from the increasingly gentrifying Ybor City Historic District. And you can see here, brick, the brick streets that used to connect the neighborhood are now dead end against sound barriers for the freeway. Miami, in addition, where I'm from, is spending a billion dollars currently. This is, I took this the other day from the Bright Line, uh, which is a cool new train. Miami is spending nearly a billion dollars to widen the Overtown Expressway, which cut through the heart of the black community in Miami of Overtown in the 1960s. And the construction of this highway in the first place resulted in the near total destruction of Overtown and the, the forcible displacement of over 12,000 residents, nearly 100% of them black. The people displaced were offered well below market value for the properties and the people who rented were offered no assistance at all. Not even, not even moving assistance. So they actually had to pay for the move that they did not choose to do. It's not just red states that are doing this. This is Los Angeles in, down, in Los Angeles County. This ongoing project has already displaced hundreds in the primarily Hispanic neighborhood of the uh, city of Downey. And this is the, the right of way. Most of these houses have already been demolished. This is the Bronx. So for the communities that remain divided by these freeways, considerable public health impacts persist. This is a noise map that maps very cleanly, that maps very cleanly onto the highway network. This is the Cross Bronx Expressway here. And the purple is actually as loud as, as, actually as, loud as a jackhammer. And tens of thousands of people live within, live within this noise shed. And moreover, the ring of highways that surrounds the South Bronx is directly responsible for the incredibly high rates of asthma in the South Bronx. And I worked with a professor at Columbia Public Health to make this map, and we, he demonstrated, Peter Munich, he has a great article out there, that this is actually a, a causal relationship. It's not just correlation. There are other factors, you know, access to healthcare, et cetera, but this is directly caused by the exhaust from the freeways, and in addition, it's also caused by the particulate matter from the brake pads, from the tires. So it's not just, even if we electrify, that's not gonna, that's not gonna eliminate that. So now, going back, going back a bit into history, so the Cross Bronx in particular 
was among the first of these interstate highways to be built. It was completed in 1955, and it displaced over 60,000 people in some of the most racially integrated neighborhoods in the country. So I've also highlighted the urban renewal projects here in orange that I'll touch on a bit later. But again, as I mentioned, everything here was funded by those two bills, the 1949 Federal Housing Act and the 1956 Federal Highway Act. So the Cross Bronx, as I mentioned, was one of the first built in the country, and it was the first in particular to be built through an existing city rather than through open country. And it was designed by planner Robert Moses, who some of you might be familiar with. The Cross Bronx is very important. I'll start this video now. This highway, the Cross Bronx, along with the BQE and others in NYC, was highly influential in the development of later highways in other cities. Not just in terms of the route it took through dense neighborhoods, racially integrated neighborhoods, but in terms of the institutions that RM developed to make to actualize this project. His Triborough TBT, Triborough Bridge and Tunnel Authority, which is his agency that he used to build these, actually was basically the precedent for many other state DOTs that were formed afterwards. Rather than follow a route that would have displaced far fewer people by cutting through some of those parks and cemeteries, Moses overruled local, object, local objections and forced the highway through the heart of the Bronx. So this is, this is Bob here. So as discussed by Robert Caro in his biography of Robert Moses, called The Power Broker, RM, or Robert Moses here viewed New York as more of a traffic problem than an actual place. And he seemingly delighted in, what, in swinging what he called his meat axe through neighborhoods with populations he despised, in particular black and Puerto Rican neighborhoods in, in New York and immigrant neighborhoods as well. While automobility was viewed as the way of the future at the time, the particular way in which Robert Moses actualized it and the people who were his sort of disciples ensured that automobility became a tool of segregation. So this is a bit on how people viewed automobility uh, after, the, after World War II. This is the future, Futurama exhibit sponsored by GM at the 1936, well, before World War II, uh, at the 1936 World's Fair. The reason for the sprint to adopt automobiles after World War II, there's many of them, but for one, it was the war economy that had brought the United States out of the Depression. And it was imperative to keep that engine running, to keep the economy from collapsing. And it was fairly simple for GM, GE, Ford, to retool from making planes and bombs to making cars and refrigerators for the suburbs. And in addition, and this, so this is sort of their idealized version of what they thought the future would look like, and it's, it's actually not too far off. And then in addition, after the war, there was a sprint to decentralize for fear of nuclear attack. But the way in which the adoption of automobility played out on the ground was the destruction of urban communities that really had the least ability to resist, that were cleared in order to make way for these new roads. This is the South Bronx again. East Tremont was heavily damaged by Robert Moses' projects. A contemporaneous investigation into Moses actually found that basically none of the people that were displaced were rehoused in the, the projects that he built. Most of them were scattered, had to leave the city, or ended up, many of them ended up homeless. In all, in New York, over 250,000 people were displaced from Robert Moses' project. And as I mentioned, this is Philly, as I mentioned, other cities followed similar tactics, forcing highways through working class communities that neighbors, that planners deemed obsolete. Here in Philly, the highway the Delaware Expressway leveled many of the working class communities along the waterfront, and then in addition divided northern Philadelphia from downtown. In this case, Edmund Bacon, who's actually Kevin Bacon's dad, which is kind of interesting, but he was a disciple of, our, of Robert Moses and was highly influenced by him. By the late 1960s in Philadelphia, 14,000 people had been displaced. Despite making up only 26% of the population, a full 72% of those displaced were black. In Boston, the highway cut through the medieval heart of the city, ramming through Chinatown and the black and immigrant New York streets neighborhood, which is now completely gone. It was, it's where this, where this interchange is here. Over 20,000 Bostonians were displaced, and despite making up only 5% of 
of Boston's total population, 32% of those displaced were black. The vast majority of the rest were Italian, Jewish, and Irish immigrants. While the Big Dig, this is the, this is the central artery that cut through the middle of the city, it's been buried since. So the Big Dig attempt, attempted to fix these mistakes by burying the highway, but ultimately it was one step forward, two steps back. The Greenway is definitely an improvement, but it, it basically sealed downtown's fate as primarily accessed by car and primarily suburban automobile-focused city center. They basically overhauled the entire organizational logic of Boston, really, to, to speed commuters in and out of the city. In Chicago, the Dan Ryan Expressway, seen here, the Dan Ryan cut through the south side and swallowed up much of the west side, and urban renewal swallowed up much of the near north. And by the late 1970s, 81,000 people had been displaced in, in Chicago, and despite making up only 23% of the population, 64% of those displaced were black. Despite a multiracial coalition led by organizer Florence Scala, to save the west side, ultimately much of it was, was leveled. Buffalo, similar story, 10,000 people were displaced, 67% of whom were black. In this case, the city paved over a linear park designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who was designer of Central Park and Prospect Park, one of the most famous landscape designers. And they paved over his park in Buffalo while leaving the similar parkways on the... So this was on the primarily black west side of Buffalo, no, sorry, east side of Buffalo. Uh, they paved over this linear parkway, but the white east, I keep mixing up west and east, the white, the white part of the city had um, parkways that are basically the exact same, you can, and they're still intact. And it was really notable during COVID because, you know, everyone was socially distancing outside, and you really saw there's, there's interesting pictures in Buffalo of, you know, these parkways on the, on the white side really being used as they were intended, but on the, on the black side, they did not. They didn't have these parks. Miami, where I'm from, sort of, West Palm Beach. Miami followed a similar pattern, displacing over 12,000 people, 100% of them black in Miami. This was over town, which was completely leveled, and is still, still not recovered. It's, it's very noticeable. This is Miami on the ground. They really destroyed Second and Third Avenues, which were the heart of Overtown. It was called Little Broadway because it had a lot of play, a lot of, a lot of theaters. And a lot of musicians, black musicians in particular, would perform in Overtown because they couldn't stay on Miami Beach because it was whites only. So these new highways cut through downtowns and made possible the development of new car-centric suburbs on the outskirts of existing cities. And these suburbs were whites only. Common at the time was a real estate practice called restrictive covenants. Uh, and that is where the developer writes into the deed that it can only be sold to members of the Caucasian race. And this was a standard practice across the country. This is an example of one of those actual... <laughs> the language is, you know, is crazy. But these were um, common practice all across the country, from Miami to San Francisco to Minneapolis seen here, to Austin to Houston. This was standard industry practice until the mid-60s. These have technically been invalidated by the Supreme Court, but they still, the, the effects of them are still being felt. There's some great articles about that out there. In addition to the restrictive covenants, even if they didn't have those, many of these new suburbs used exclusionary zoning tactics. So for instance, prohibiting multifamily housing, only allowing the cities to build single-family housing, meaning that only people who could afford such a house could live there. And that was outside of many people's price range. And in addition, things like parking minimums in the suburbs have made it so it's just difficult to build housing. So these practices, restrictive covenants, exclusionary zoning, and the development of highways encouraged and exacerbated white flight. And American city centers entered a period of significant decay as cities cut back on municipal services because tax bases dried up due to white flight. And again, city centers entered a period of significant decline. And this begins the era of urban renewal. So this is Boston seen here. With highway construction and white flight in full swing, 
Cities sought to remake their civic cores for the convenience of suburban white commuters. This was also sponsored by federal legislation like the highways. This was the 1949 Federal, Heis federal Housing Act, which paid for two thirds of this. So cities really jumped at the opportunity because they were basically leaving money on the table if they, if they didn't do this. So again, cities used the decay as an excuse to remake their course for the convenience of commuters. In this case, the Italian and Jewish neighborhood of the West End was completely leveled. Chief planner in Boston, Ed Logue, who was another dis Moses disciple, he deemed this neighborhood obsolete and it was leveled over the course of two summers. And this neighborhood is actually where Leonard Nimoy is from, Spock. He has some cool interviews of what it was like actually living here. And urban renewal, let me play one more video. A boy last week who was 16 in San Francisco told me on television, thank God we got him to talk. Maybe somebody will start to listen. He said, I got no country, I've got no flag. Now he's only 16 years old. And I couldn't say you do. I don't have any evidence to prove that he does. They were tearing down his house because San Francisco is engaging as all, most northern cities now are engaged in something called urban renewal, which means moving the Negroes out. Getting, it means Negro removal. That is what it means. And the federal government is, a, is, is, a, is an accomplice to this fact. Now this, we're talking about human beings. There's not such a thing as a monolithic wall or you know, some abstraction called the Negro problem. These are Negro boys and girls who at 16 and 17 don't believe the country means anything that it says, don't feel they have any place here on the basis of the performance of the entire country. But now, Jim... No, am I exaggerating? No, I certainly could not say that you're exaggerating. So, urban renewal projects targeted communities of color with such intensity that even in, in cities, so with this, this chart I made with the New York Times, it's in the article, so what this chart is showing is that, for instance, here in Philadelphia, despite making up, I actually mentioned this earlier, but despite making up only about 20% of the population in 1960, about 70% of those displaced were people of color. In Philadelphia, that's mostly black. In nearly every city, it disproportionately affects the non-white community. Cities paved over vibrant, this is Boston, Roxbury, Cities paved over vibrant neighborhoods and replaced them with amenities focused on suburban commuters. In this case, in Roxbury, which is officially known as the heart of black culture in Boston, the government leveled Dudley Square, now Nubian Square, which was the center of the neighborhood. And this church was actually led by Reverend Michael T. Haynes, a local civil rights leader in Boston, and he has some really sad interviews about his mom's house was taken through eminent domain, and she was offered $6,000 for it, which was a well below market value at the time. This is Chicago. In select northern and western cities, urban renewal also took the form of the development of public housing, which is obviously a great idea in theory, but the way that we actualized it was not. Cities like Chicago and New York developed highly dense high-rise public housing and they exclusively located them in already in existing communities of color. The intent of this, so, Prior to the 1960s, officials in Chicago were very open uh, about what their intent of this was. They wanted to, here in Chicago, they wanted to over, limit the overflow of people of color from the near north side into the Gold Coast, which is one of Chicago's wealthiest neighborhoods. Thus, the goal of the high-rises was, was containment through segregation, concentrating people of color into specific locations and limiting their housing, limiting their housing options elsewhere. So egregious was the discrimination in Chicago's public housing that in 1966, the Supreme Court actually found them in violation of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Still more urban land was used for institutional expansion as seen here. The Maxwell Street Market in Chicago was completely leveled for an expansion of the University of Illinois, Chicago. This market was located in the Italian, Black, and Jewish West Side. And it's actually interesting that the market, Maxwell Street Market, was known, a lot of musicians would perform there. It's where the Chicago, so it's known as like the, the birthplace of the Chicago blues because a lot of performers would come because it's where everyone was. And then in order to be heard over the, the market, they, they used amplify, you know, they used electric guitars. It's, it's, if you've seen the movie The Blues Brothers, a lot of it takes place 
in the market before it was destroyed, actually, and there's some great scenes. In Atlanta, so again, center cities were demolished and remade for the convenience of people in the suburbs, and this is Atlanta, the neighborhood of Mechanicsville, which was a black neighborhood south of downtown here, named after the many railroad mechanics. Um, railroads actually were one of the first desegregated industries, and these were mechanics, so it was a skilled job. It was a, very, it was a fairly upper-middle-class neighborhood at the time, and they completely cleared it for the, the construction of the highway, and then in addition, again, they... Cities try to remake their cores to attract people, not to attract people from the suburbs, not necessarily to live there, but to spend money, go to a game, and get the hell out at night. They tried to train, you know, transform downtowns into nine to five office districts. That's why here in Austin, you know, this building, you know, this, uh, the, the convention center, you know, is is uh, convention centers are another example of the type of giant building that they plop on downtowns. This is Bedford Stuyvesant. Even in New York, many roads were transformed to be easier to commute to by cars. Miami. In other cases, this is so still talking about urban renewal. In other cases, neighborhoods that were destroyed for urban renewal were simply abandoned as the projects were canceled halfway through. In this case, in Eastwick in Philadelphia, the neighborhood was totally leveled, displacing 10,000 people. One resident wrote in protest when they declared the neighborhood a slum. She said, most, people con most people's conceptions of slums is a filthy cluttered section breeding disease and criminals. The majority of Eastwick is green grass and trees. The city plans on building project homes to clutter up these green fields, laying a model, laying a model foundation for a slum area to develop. If the city council passes this bill, Eastwick residents will be a mass of displaced persons forced to buy other homes, many beyond their means. Ultimately, that's what happened. The community was scattered and destroyed. The land was sold back to a private developer who did not end up developing it due to lack of demand from the type of people that he wanted to sell to. As I mentioned, many cities destroyed public spaces, destroyed their downtowns in order to make it easier to commute to, and many public goods were destroyed. So in this example, so this is an example from a book called The Sum of Us by Heather McGee. The central metaphor of her book is the public swimming pool. Before the 1950s, public swimming pools were common in American cities, and they were segregated. They were whites only. In the 1950s, when the, the Supreme Court orders desegregation, rather than integrate these pools, many cities actually just drain them and demolish them. This is Baltimore. This happened all over the country. After, the, after these pools are drained, this is when you see then the rise popularity of backyard swimming pools in the suburbs. And so what happened here is that in the name of avoiding integration and upholding segregation, we destroyed a public good and privatized it. And now we made it for the only people who could afford backyard swimming pools. That is to some extent what we did with public transportation as well. Public transportation was left to decay as white flight was in full force. This is Philadelphia. This is the public transit network, the electric public transit network in 38 versus today. These networks were left to decay and were demolished, especially ones that served dense city, city centers. Stations were removed, access was limited, and this happened all over the country. We significantly downsized our public transit networks as we sought to redefine what public meant. New York. Berkeley, uh, Oakland, Chicago again. And even in cities that we don't typically think, this is Miami, even in cities that we typically don't think of as having grown up around accessible public transit, this is Miami, even Miami had a significant network. Even Houston had a significant transit network. But it is gone. So what can we do about it? So in my professional work. I work at, a, at the engineering firm ACOM. I've been focused in particular on the Cross Bronx Expressway. One of the things we're trying to do is mitigate pedestrian deaths. One of the predictable results of having built all these highways through neighborhoods of color is that there's more pedestrian deaths there because there's more traffic. And in addition, there's been less investment in safety infrastructure. So we're trying to change that. We worked with the city to map the pedestrian deaths, and you can really see that they are concentrated in the South Bronx, and many of these roads are high-speed, dangerous roads. The Grand Concourse was 
remade for cars, made very dangerous. One of the projects I've worked on is the boulevardization, which is kind of a mouthful, of the Sheridan Expressway seen here in the South Bronx. So the Sheridan was built by, by RM in the 50s, and it divided the South Bronx from Starlight Park down here. And they also basically completely leveled Starlight Park. Starlight Park was a former, it was basically the Bronx's Coney Island, but it burned down, and then they replaced it with another park, but that park was gutted because they used it as a staging area for the construction of the Cross Bronx Expressway. And when they were finished, they basically just left it abandoned. So what we did here is we, it's called designing. So this is no longer an interstate. It's still pretty, it's not as safe as it could be, but we made some progress. So we reactivated the park, turned the boulevard into more pedestrian friendly environment. And pedestrian deaths actually have been reduced on this corridor. We haven't, we don't have like a ton of data yet, but I'm pretty confident that it will help. And yeah, in addition, we, we provided connections across the river. There were connections back in the day, but many of them were demolished. There's actually fewer bridges today between, this, is, this isn't Harlem and the Bronx, but there's actually fewer bridges today between Harlem and the Bronx than there were in the 30s. And as part of this project, you know, it was interesting during COVID, you know, it was during COVID. So we did a lot of, normally we do a lot of public outreach um, in person, but um, this time we did it virtually and we actually got like a lot more people attending because, because it was virtual. So I, I think that's something they might keep adopting. And now we're trying to do something similar for the Cross Bronx. We are trying to potentially cap it. I would prefer removing it, but that's kind of a tough, tough issue. But so now we're working with the mayor. We're working with the mayor to, to study potentially mitigating the damage, well, to study mitigating the damage from the Cross Bronx. Other countries, though, have shown that even more bold solutions are possible than capping. This here is Utrecht in the Netherlands. They, in the 70s, built over one of their historic canals with a highway, and everyone immediately hated it. And they, they ripped it out and re restored the canal. But what's, what's important about this project and this one over here that I'll explain in a second, is that they didn't just remove the highway, they, well, they did, but then they built a tram line next to it. You know, they replaced the, there was still transit travel demand that needed to be met, and they, they, they did that. They, they built a tram line, which is something that we seem incapable of doing. And then this is the, this is a river in Seoul that was built it was built over a tributary of the Han River, the river that goes right through Seoul. And it basically, like, it's a, the river was underneath there. It basically became like an open sewer. And in the 2000s, they ripped it out and daylighted the river. And it's now become one of the most popular attractions in Seoul. It's like a six mile long linear park. It's also useful for just transportation. It's like a high line on steroids. But again, they didn't just rip out the highway, they built two parallel metro lines to relieve that demand. And in Seoul, they changed a lot of the land use, eliminating parking minimums and building more dense housing. This isn't a great example, but it's Oakland. And it's not a great example because the city didn't proactively do this. This collapsed in an earthquake. So I don't think they get credit for that, but they did, they did improve it. There actually are some places in the United States that are doing a decent job of, of mitigating this damage. So this is Rochester, New York, and you can see this highway. So cities were really obsessed with looping, with sort of protecting in space their downtowns because, you know, white flight causes these inner city neighborhoods. I'm not saying that as a dog whistle. I mean, literally the, the neighborhoods near downtown become primarily non-white because of white flight. Cities want to sort of save and salvage their, their historic and commercial downtowns by remaking them for people in the, in the suburbs and making it easier for them to access. So this loop is a really common theme. Houston, Kansas City, and then where there's not a full loop, there's often a river or something that causes, that completes the, the sort of wall. This loop though, they've actually demolished it and they didn't do what Boston did, like burying it. They actually, so it's cool because I like to do this like this. You can see that 2014, but then they fill it in and they build housing, which is awesome. I love to see this. They repair the grid. It, it, some of it's affordable housing. There's not, a, there's not enough, but, but this is such a great project. And I'm always shocked to see that this is, you know, in the United States. So 
Syracuse is doing something similar, tearing down the highway that cut through the 15th Ward, which was part of the black community there. It was actually started as a freedman's town way back in the day. To close, so the recently signed Inflation Reduction Act and the IIJA, the two bills actually threatened to feed our national appetite for highway widening by emphasizing the funding of electric vehicles at the expense of more equitable and sustainable modes of transit, the federal government is choosing to repeat past mistakes, encouraging cities and encouraging cities and states to do the same. Demolishing someone's house for the convenience of, an, of a suburbanite driving an electric car is hardly any better than if the car were powered by gasoline. So President Biden actually has a phrase he likes to say, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. It's, it's not looking great. <laughs> they, this project was given, um, I think, $4 billion, but then the actual highways were given about $100 billion. So it's, it's, that's the budget. So we shouldn't double down on failed urban highway planning that keeps Americans divided from one another. For the United States to adapt to a changing and urbanizing world, the federal government must reckon with the automobile-based segregation it has encouraged for the past 70 years, investing instead in public transit and walkability. And yes, in many cases, cities should follow Rochester's lead, recognizing that these hulking concrete structures are a failed 1960s technology. They're the mistakes of the previous generation. We should tear them down, let cities heal. I'll end there. This is sources. I wouldn't be able to do this project without all that. Like, it, this is, I'm very, like, I'm sort of an editor almost. Like, th pe these people have written about this for years. Uh, so I wouldn't be able to do this without, without all of these folks.